If you have your Bibles tonight, let's turn to the book of Luke. Book of Luke, chapter 16, verse 19. Amen. Luke, chapter 16, and verse 19. It's good to be in God's house with God's people. Amen say it all the time and I'll say it again. I'm glad that where two or three are gathered, doesn't matter if you're in the U.S., Mexico, or out in the middle of communist China, knowing that you could be taken at any moment where two or three are gathered in his name. That's the only prerequisite for him showing up is to be gathered in his name. Amen. He'll be there in the midst of us. And folks, I know it's a Wednesday night. I know that uh, that a lot of times we come Wednesday night and, and it's a uh, it's a uh, boost in the arm. It's a, it's it's something just to get us through the rest of the week. And uh, I know that a lot of times we're we're looking to get to church, do our, I was going to say our priestly duties, but that's off of a movie, so I won't use that quote. We're looking to do our our Christian duties, and uh, and get home. And so we're not going to be long winded tonight, but I am trying to share what the Lord's laid on my heart. I had a had a couple of different messages, and uh, one would have been a lot safer than this one, but we're going to go ahead and preach what the Lord laid on our hearts. Amen. Book of Luke, chapter 16, and verse 19. Now, I want to preface this. This is actually a message that I preached uh, some years back, um, but the Lord's brought it back into the forefront of my mind and into the forefront of my heart because I was, I was reading and I was studying the, the book of Mark the other day, and I was reading over there in chapter 9, and the Bible is talking about, it's talking about the man that approaches Jesus. And, and I don't want to paraphrase, I don't want to get something out of context, but you know what I'm talking about when he says, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And we're living in a day and time where Christians all over the world, that's not just America, I, I got told I was just with Brother Brian Bridges down in Alabama, and he looked at me and he said, Brother Jonathan, Americans are spoiled, aren't we? And I said, no, sir, I don't, I don't personally believe that. I believe Americans are blessed. They're blessed because they gave to missions all around the world, and they are receiving from what not just we in our generation gave, but what generation upon generation has given, we are now living in one of the most blessed times that America's ever had. We're living in some of the richest times, as far as economically speaking, around the world. And now, if anybody likes it or not, we do have Donald Trump to thank for that, and God put him in so that he could make us this way. Now, in saying all that, in all of our blessings, we've lost sight of what's truly important in our lives, truly important in our ministry, in our culture, in our church, and that is to believe God's word as it is written, no matter what our thoughts are. We begin to opinion, we begin to uh, try to try to mold the Bible to what our consciousness uh, will allow us to think, and we begin to fall short in what we truly believe in the word of God. And I want to take this particular passage, the passage in Luke chapter 16, you know it well, and I want to preach, and, and because you know it well, we're preaching on hell tonight, and I want to preach on a passion lit by hell, on a passion lit by hell, and we're speaking in the literal sense tonight. And folks, I want to encourage you, I want to, I want to, I want to start out by saying, I want to encourage you to truly become convicted, truly be filled with a conviction that hell is real. Now, so many times we say it is. So many times we pay it lip service. In fact, constantly we hear it in the movies how people can go to this horrible place. Constantly people misuse it and misappropriate it, and it's become a byword in our society. But how many of us truly believe in hell? Now, we say we do. We, we talk about hell, we hear messages about hell, we hear songs about not going to hell, but how many of us truly believe in this horrible place called hell? I want to tell you the people that are in hell tonight believe in hell. They believe in hell more than we could ever consciously believe in hell. 
But the word of God is clear that there is a heaven and it is also very clear that there is a hell. And our mission here on earth, our whole being, the reason that God has left us here and didn't rapture us out the moment that we got saved is so that we could get other people out of this horrendous place called hell. Now I also have to say these verses, many will take it. Many false religions have taken these verses and and out of context they say it's just like the verses before them. It's just a parable. It's just a wise saying. It's just an example that Christ has given. And you know what? They are absolutely totally wrong. Now in this particular verse, in this particular passage, and we're not going to jump around, the reason why I know it's true, the reason why I know it's not a parable is because Christ never mentions a man's name in a parable and he talks about Lazarus in this scripture and if you do if you go around the Bible and you begin to study this place called hell you begin to study the eternity of it you begin to study that the worm dies not you begin to study that the soul there even though it is considered dead spiritually it will have a consciousness for all eternity and while we enjoy that beautiful place called heaven there will be millions and millions and millions of souls dying and going to that place. There will be millions of souls burning for all eternity. Why don't we believe? It's because our passion hasn't been lit on this subject. You know, some of us are passionate about hunting. I love to hunt. Some of us are passionate about fishing. Man, you talk to me out in the parking lot, I'll tell you what I caught this week with Brother Brian Bridges. It was a blast. There's so many of us. There's women that are passionate about shopping. And you know, I no offense, women. It's okay to, to be passionate about something. It's okay to be passionate about shopping. Just remember, your husband has a limit on those credit cards. We're all passionate about something. But I don't listen to somebody's passion. I watch them live it out. And so many times, I know that Christians don't have their passions lit for this terrible place called hell. Because of the way they live their lives, it is obvious that even though they say they do, they don't believe in this horrible place called hell. Now notice verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abram's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You have to imagine it with me, folks. Now, I live, I, I get to the opportunity while I'm here in the States to live in a very richy neighborhood. It's an amazing thing. And I'm not, I'm not picking on the rich. I wouldn't pick on them even, even if I did know them, even if they treated me wrong. I still wouldn't pick on them. That's their, that's their choice to do whatever they want to do. But I cannot imagine, and they've seen me kind of rough everywhere I go. They see me kind of oily sometimes. Uh, sometimes I go fishing and, and, and I get back home. And you know what? There's still a little dirt under the fingernail where I chopped that worm in half. And, and, and a lot of times those rich people, man, I, I look at them and, and I'm, not, I'm not degrading them. But I know one thing's for certain that they would never ask me to come put my finger on their tongue. It's just not going to happen. You know what? They look at me and they think, and I don't know what they think. I'm just using illustrations here, folks. They think that dirty Mexican, there ain't no way he should be cleaning my gutters, not, not putting his finger in my water jug. But you look at this rich man, and it's an amazing thing that he goes from faring sumptuously. He goes from having everything he wants. He goes from the crackers that are falling off of his table, feeding the poor and the needy around him, to being in hell and saying, God, that one that was full of sores, that one that was dirty, that beggar that sat at the end of my table, send him down here. And even if it's just a drop of water, that's all I want. That's all I need. Please send him to give me a little refreshment in this flame. 
You see, he believed in hell the moment he got to hell. His passion was lit in an instant. I want to notice in this particular in this particular context of these particular verses, in verse 19 through 22, and if you're looking for an outline, in verse 19 through 22, we see his carelessness on hell. In fact, Abram tells him, you know what? You had your opportunity. Lazarus did too. He's here. You're there because you squandered what you had the opportunity to take care of. I wonder how many of us are careless on the facts of hell because we've never seen hell. We've never been there. You know, we live in a time, we live in a place, Brother Charles, and I praise God for it, but we live in a time and place where people die in the hospital and we don't hear their screams anymore. We live in a time and place where they dope us up and the pain and the agony of those in, of those last moments, and I'm not trying to be cruel, I'm not trying to be gross, but you hear me. The pain and the agony of those last moments is suffocated by the drugs that they pump into our system. And I'm all for it, folks. I don't want to see somebody writhing in pain in their last moments. But I wonder how many people have split hell wide open because in their last moments they were so filled with drugs that they couldn't hear the last opportunity. They couldn't hear the last call. They couldn't hear that last sound of the gospel. They couldn't hear the message. But I look at this man and I realize something. That in the moment that he split hell wide open, he immediately, he immediately saw Abram and Lazarus. He immediately saw the paradise that he had lost. He immediately began to regret all the decisions, all the fun that he had had on this earth. Why? Because in that moment's time, all that carelessness that he had had on earth, all that joy, all that all that wanting to live what he wanted to do, doing, doing the way that he wanted to do it. And you look at him as a lost man and you see him split in hell wide open. But I wonder how many of us here tonight as careless Christians will send somebody else to that terrible place because we simply don't believe that it exists. If we believe that it exists, it changes our existence here on earth. Why do I go to church on Sunday morning? Why do I go to church on Sunday night? Why do I go to church on Wednesday night? Is there not funner things that I could be out doing right now? But I got four little kids back there. And it is my responsibility as a daddy to make sure that not one of them ends up in hell. I got a passion against hell. I want to rip every last soul that hell has out of its grasp and take it to heaven with me. I've got a passion to make sure that not just white people don't go to hell, not just brown people down there don't go to hell, not just the red man that I work with down there in Panama don't go to hell, but I've got a passion in me that nobody that comes into contact with me goes to hell because of my actions. I wonder how many of us are sent and careless Because we simply don't believe that it's real. In a moment's time, in an instant, that man split hell wide open. That man got to hell, and in a moment's time, he's looking and he's saying, Hey, this is the place that I was warned of. This is the place that everybody told me of when I was over there fair and sumptuously. I can imagine he was probably a young man by the way the scripture portrays him. Not caring, not being worried. Older men, they begin to worry. They begin to try to fix things up in their life. They begin to try to get everything together for the end of, the, of their life. They try to make sure their family's okay. They try to make sure their children are okay. But I believe that this man was probably young. He was probably in his 20s or 30s. The strength of his life was still running through his veins. And the next thing you know, he wakes up in hell because his heart stopped beating, because his lungs stopped working, because something happened that took his life away before he could get out of hell. I wonder how many of us are careless still. Oh, he was a lost man. Yeah, there might be somebody here that's lost too. But what about us saved people? What if you're the opportunity that some lost man has and your carelessness is just blowing it away? Your carelessness is just is just passing them by. I noticed this passion lit by hell. His carelessness was gone because he had his passion lit by hell. But then I want to notice his cry in verse 23 and in verse 24. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented 
in this flame. I notice his cry. His cry is so important in this particular passage because it shows us that even as a soul burning in hell, he has certain attributes that we on this earth have. He is able to lift up a voice and to cry out to Father Abraham. He's crying out for help. There is a consciousness in him that he can holler, he can call out. That means, folks, if you notice it, that means that in his attributes as a human being, in his attributes as a soul, we don't understand how it all works, but I notice right there that his cry begins to emanate. As a, as a, as a person, he still has his faculties. As a person, he is calling out, he is crying out, he is saying, hey, now I need your help. Now I need to get out of this place. Now I need to go somewhere else. The passion began to burn because it was burning all around him. And you think about that rich man tonight. And if we could open a portal and look into hell tonight. So many people talking about uh, a different dimension. So many people talking about uh, parallel universes and all that stupidity. And, and, and you look at it and the reason why they're doing it is because they're trying to psychologically damage people from getting to the gospel. It's just another way that the devil is trying to block people's minds from getting out of that horrible place called hell. It's not a parallel universe. It's a place that down under us and it's still burning and he's still burning and he's still burning and he's still crying and he's still crying and he's still crying and he's, still crying and he's saying, somebody help me. I wonder, was he doing that right before he went to hell? See, on earth he had those same faculties. He could hear. I wonder what on earth he could hear that in hell he didn't. I wonder what on earth he could see that in hell he didn't. The passion began to burn in him because he had been lit by hell. I wonder how many of us here today are sitting in ease, sitting at ease in silence because we've never truly seen hell like it is. Because we've never believed in hell like we should believe it. I tell God all the time, Lord, help me with my unbelief. I need to believe this if I don't believe anything else. I need to believe this point right here. It's what will keep me going when everything else is turned off. It's what will keep, it's, it's keep me sane when I'm in the hard times, that I'm doing it to keep people out of that place. I look at him. He had a cry. What does that mean? That means he had a mouth. That means he had a tongue. He formed words. That means he had a tongue. I wonder what the tongue there in hell tastes. I wonder what the tongue there in hell tastes. The souls of other condemned that are burning for eternity. The sulfur that's rising up out of the, out of the ash of hell. I look at him. He had eyes. Now, according to scripture, and I believe we're in agreement on this, preacher. You set me down if we're not. But according to scripture, when Christ went and took the saints out, this is pre that. I wonder if he still sees Abraham afar off. I don't believe he does. His eyes in that moment could see Abel because it was a chasm separating. I don't believe it's that way anymore. I wonder what the eyes of the people that have gone to hell because of us, I wonder what their eyes are seeing tonight. If you're here and you're lost without God, I wonder what your eyes will see when you bust hell wide open. Oh, that's mean, preacher. No, 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 you understand me. I used to be a paramedic, and when we'd jump in and try to save a drowning victim, we wouldn't swim up to him. Do you want to get out of the water now? Would you, would you like to come to the edge with me? Here, let me help you out. Let me No. You know what they taught us to do? Slap them. We'd walk out there, and they'd be, oh, finally, somebody's coming to save me. What'd you hit me for? Because I don't want you drowning me. I'm getting you out. I don't like these messages on hell. I don't like to hear how people are burning. Hey, I'm trying to get you out of that place. I'm trying to get you to get other people out of that place. We're in a dangerous, volatile situation in this country we live in. And nobody's worried about it because we're not lit. We're not on passion about the things we should be passionate about. Everything else should come second to hell. Everything else should come second to that horrible place. What could he see? There was a conversation being had. That means he had a tongue. That means he had a mouth. That means, that means he had a voice. A little later, his voice changes from bring me a drop of water 
to somebody, go get my relative. He had a voice. Since he was having a conversation, he had to have ears. That means they have ears in hell. I wonder how many of us know somebody that is hearing in hell tonight. Have you ever thought about that? Does it not bother you that you may know somebody that's in hell? Does it not bother you that somebody could be hearing the screams of the condemned in hell tonight? Have you ever thought about it? You know why we don't like to think about it? Because it makes us uncomfortable. We don't want to think about that rich man. But it's a lot easier to read about a rich man in God's word than to think about somebody in our near distant past that might be in that horrible place because of something we did. I wonder. I wonder. I don't have to wonder. I say this in shame. I know people that are there because of me. And I know what their ears are hearing. Because in hell there's nothing good. I wonder who they're meeting in hell. Isn't that where the demons are? Or going to be? Isn't that where the devil's going to be? That's where murderers go. That's where sodomites. I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. Wonder who's there. Wonder if Ted Bundy made it there. I wonder about the people that are there. And I wonder if they get to see you. Oh, it is outer darkness. But apparently he's seeing something. We're sitting here tonight in our comfort. Man, I love padded pews. As soon as I can, I'm going to make padded pews in Panama. It is much easier to sit through a six-hour service when you got padded pews. But I don't ever want to get so comfortable that I forget what's outside the doors of the church. You see this man, he had all his attributes. He had his feelings. He felt the torment of hell. His cry emanated because it got lit by hell. I wonder if any of us are crying tonight with a passion like this man did. You look at it and you find that his passion was lit and it got rid of his carelessness. His passion was lit and it made him cry out. But his passion was lit by the caution that Abraham gave him. Notice, and these next two points can be welded into one, by the caution and the chasm. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Got one chance. See, if our passion is lit, we know we got one chance. It might be the last time we get to talk to the neighbor. It might be the last time that we get to deal with somebody down the street. It might be the last time that that gas station attendant sees somebody that could actually take them out of that horrible place. He says, once you're past this point, there's no coming back. You can't come over here, we can't go over there. You realize how hard that is to think about? It's hard to comprehend. Even as a preacher, even I, I have literally, Brother Charles, I have literally fasted and prayed that God will send me a vision on hell. I've never seen a real vision on hell. I don't think I have. I've seen houses burned down. I've seen burn victims. That's nowhere near what's going on in hell. In one moment's time, you and I could be the deciding factor of where somebody's going to spend the rest of their eternity. Does it not move you? Does it not move you, as Jeremiah said, how many you're passing by? Does it not move you how many you see around you? Oh, we'll send missionaries across the world. But we won't tell our neighbor about Christ 
We'll send missionaries to the other side of the world, but we won't call our relatives up and tell them about Christ. Is your passion lit? I want a passion lit by heaven. I see this man, and I see a passion that won't go out because he realizes he will never leave that place. Nobody can come get him. Nobody can take him away from that place. Nobody can help him. All his money back in the bank ain't going to get him back from that place. All his relatives back on earth praying for him ain't going to get him back from that place. There is a great goal fixed. Destroy every Catholic doctrine you've ever heard. There is a great goal fixed that we cannot go to you and you cannot come to us. You've done it. You've had your opportunity. Passion lit by heaven. What happens? See his carelessness on earth. You see his cry when he hits the lake of fire. But once you see that caution handed out by Abraham, it's an amazing thing to me, folks, and I want you to notice this. He doesn't ask for anything else for himself. Full realization, I'm here to stay. I can't do anything for myself. Imagine getting to that point. I'm here to stay. I can't do anything for myself. What does he do? Look with me. Verses 27 through 31. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. This rich man had no consciousness of God just a few minutes before. And in a moment's time, he's going from an atheist, somebody that could care less, about God and what God says, to fully believing in miracles, somebody can raise up from the dead, somebody can go back to my relatives. What happened? One moment's time, one shutting of the eyes that no longer opened, and in hell he lifted up his spiritual, his soul life, being in torment. I wonder what's stopping us from having that passion. What was stopping him? Scripture says it. He was fair and sumptuous. He was having a good time. He was too busy dressing up. Y'all hearing me? He was too busy making money. That's what the verses are saying. He was too busy constantly. And folks, I'm not being mean about this, but you hear me. He was too busy filling his belly while Lazarus sat at his table without anything to eat. That's a lost man. His priorities, his passion, everything that he ever thought of changed in one instant. He no longer worried if he could get the next gold bullion that came out. No longer worried if his friends were going to like how his banquet was. He no longer worried about whether his wife was going to like the way he dressed, whether he looked just right or not, whether the cloth just fell just right against that wonderful, manly appearance that he had. It was gone. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. In a moment, he began to care for those that were lost. In a moment, he began to ask for a miracle. In a moment, he began to cry out for his brothers that were still on earth saved. I wonder how many of us tonight are truly caring for the lost that are around us. So much so that we'll take time to ask God for a miracle. So much so that we'll leave all the comforts of house and home to make sure that they get the word. He said, hey, that beggar, let him go back. 
Let him do it. If nobody else can do it, let him do it. Make a miracle. What changed? He saw the realities of hell. He saw the realities of hell. Have you seen the realities of hell tonight? Have you heard of the realities of hell tonight? Do you believe in the realities of hell? I began to believe when I was 19 or 20 years old tonight. I think I've shared the story with you. I'm not sure. But I began to believe because I was working paramedic. See, here in the States, it's an amazing thing, and I love it. But your paramedics got morphine. They got oxycodone. They've got, they, they've even got some illegal stuff that they're allowed to have to kill the pain when somebody's completely destroyed. We didn't have that. And I had the opportunity to help people down in Mexico. God gave me the opportunity to run into burning buildings, to run into car crashes. And it was at that time that I started believing in hell like it truly was. Up to that point, hell was just a byword for me too. Oh, I know we say that we believe it. But up to that point, I was still straddling the fence. Yeah, hell's real. But I'm going to drink me another soda pop. Yeah, hell's real. But I'm too busy flirting with a girl. Yeah, hell's real. But I'm too busy working, making a living. And it all changed one day, preacher. When we were out on a call. Priest from one of the local churches with his sister and his two nieces and one nephew in the back seat, head on collision with a little Nissan Frontier that was loaded with potatoes. One car was going 80, one car was going 60. We know about how the brake marks were on the ground when they ran into each other. Priest broke both his arms, his sister split her face. Little kid was thrown out onto the front. Who knows how he didn't get an injury? We still don't know. The sister was injured. I think there was a couple of broken limbs. We got her out, secured her. And then when we went to the other sister, she looked fine. She looked normal. And then suddenly something started happening in her. Apparently she had had some internal hemorrhage, something that couldn't be seen. And as we were prepping As we were getting her ready to go, I remember that I was the one at her head. We were strapping her to the board because she could no longer move on her own. We wanted to make sure if something was broke that it wasn't going to be injuring her more. And we're strapping her down, and she reached up and grabbed my paramedic vest and began to pull on me. I remember it like it was yesterday. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. I don't want to burn. I remember her name. I remember her age. I remember seeing her around town. I remember looking down in her eyes. Don't let me go. I don't want to burn. Superhuman strength pulling down on my vest. Don't let me go. I'm falling. I don't want to burn. I looked at my paramedic buddy. What's wrong with her? She's just in shock. God put it in my heart. If you wanted to see hell, this is hell. And she's going there. That was about 14 years ago. She's still there, Brother Joe. She's still there. I had the opportunity. I didn't tell her. She's still there. I remember some little kids I lost next door to our neighborhood. They're still there tonight, preacher. I had the chance. And I didn't tell them, and they're still there. What about you tonight? Do you really believe in hell? Do you really believe that your mama, that your daddy, that your brother, that your sister could end up in that horrible place? You're going to tell me that you believe it. It changed me. Not a conference, not a camp. Not a preacher's sermon changed me like I changed that day and I won't go back
because I could toss somebody else their head. Do a lot of praying nowadays. My number one prayer is for my children. Don't let them go to that horrible place. But while I pray, I try to be, let it be the passion that drives me forth. There's so many. I've been I've been criticized for trying to stay too busy. I've been criticized, talked about, because I've got too many things going at the same time. I'll turn it around on them when they do. At least when they do it to my face. And I'll tell them that the reality is that they haven't seen the hell that I've seen and experienced that horrible place in Africa. We live in the greatest country on earth. I would say outside of doctors and nurses, there is very few people that have ever seen somebody go to hell. And yet our culture, even us as Christians, will use it as such a small thing. When in reality, we need our passion to be lit by that horrible place. Because only through knowing its devastation can we truly stay passionate in keeping people out of that place. I wonder about you tonight. Is your heart set on fire? Are you truly passionate about the things of God? Let me encourage you. Let it light by the fires of hell, and it will never go out. That rich man is still begging for people today. If you're here and you're lost, I promise you without a shadow of a doubt, no matter your age, no matter your skin color, no matter rich or poor, somebody in hell is crying out for you. Begging God that somebody will come by your way and tell you about that horrible place. Tonight's the night that it happened. Tonight's the night that the Holy Ghost is touching your heart. Don't tell him what you did. Don't tell him where you've been. Don't tell him what you've done. Let him transform your life. Let him mold you as somebody prays for you by name from that horrible place. For the rest of us, there should be an open burden, an open wound in our heart that we ask God never to seal, that we can always have a passion for that horrible place called hell, that it can be lit just like this rich man's was by the same flames of hell. Will you stand with me tonight?